play a game? Why, yes. I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome live from Little Rock. It is Shane Plays Radio. I'm Shane Stacks, your host for Geek Talk Radio. Uh, we're going to do a little bit different format today. We've got a really cool guest on. He's waiting in the wings right now. So a lot of times we do our interview the second half of the show, but we're going to get kicked off right off the bat uh, with an interview with Chris Perkins, who is a, uh, he does, I thought he was the DM to the stars, which he is, but after doing more research, he's also heavily involved with with shaping D and D in general, I knew he was a employee of Wizards of the Coast, but he does a lot of stuff. We'll get to talk to him about. Uh, of course, he does the Acquisitions Incorporated celebrity D and D game at PAX East. Uh, if you go out there and search for him, he does many other games with high profile folks, and he just enjoys D and D in general. So we're going to have him joining us, uh, like just post haste. I just want to throw out real quick. Don't forget, you can always call the show at five zero one. 823-0965. That's 501-823-0965. And you can tweet me at Shane Plays. That's just at Shane Plays. So uh, we're gonna do we're gonna do an interview with Chris. If anybody wants to call in, they're they're welcome to. I've got some questions people asked on Reddit. We'll be asking Chris. Um, and then uh, if you want to call in or if you want to tweet a question, I'm happy to get those in the mix too. Uh, so. And don't forget, you can always go to shaneplays.com. There's a post up there right now with show notes. So as we're talking through the show, you can follow along. Uh, there's information on, on Chris. Uh, where after we interview Chris, we're going to have Dungeons & Dragons news. There's links there. And then just geeky news in general. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the DM's DM, the dungeon master himself, Chris Perkins. Chris, welcome to Shane Plays. Thank you so much. You are welcome. I'm so excited to have you on. Uh, you know, you're you're in one of those positions where there's a lot of people that know you that you don't know them <laughs> from from the high pro- profile nature of what you do in the D and D world. So this this is very much exciting for me to be talking with you and to just learn more about you know you and 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 Dungeons and Dragons. So thanks so much for coming on. We were talking briefly before the show and you said you're actually at work you're you're actually at the wizards of the coast offices today uh working on exciting new stuff that's right i'm locked in my cage with my typewriter yeah banging away on banging away on stuff that people won't see for a while really all right is it is it and i want to i don't want to put you on the spot but is it is it anything you can hint or tease us with or will we just have to wait you'll just have to wait okay well that's that's even more exciting so uh well man you know i i'll i'll tell you your uh, your Twitter profile says that you are a New York Times bestselling writer, a D and D storyteller, a dungeon master, and the proud owner of a Choweenie named Milo. Yeah, so, so a, big, I, a big part of my life. He gets me out of the office occasionally. Does he? All right. So the world is waiting with bated breath to know how is Milo. He is doing great. Yeah, he's I, a little sad. He's a little sad right now because he's home and I'm not. Oh, uh, so okay. Well. But anticipation makes the heart grow fonder, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, well, I, I love weenie dogs. I can't say that I've ever seen a chihuahua, but uh, I love the sound of it. So. Yeah, it's a it's a chihuahua dachshund mix. They're okay. Very smart, they're very gentle, and they're explorers. They love to explore. So he's uh-huh. a dog after my own heart. Cool. Uh, well, I, I'm I'm a big animal fan. Uh, but anyway, so let's just move right into what I wanted. To, here's what I thought we were going to be talking about, because I know you as a dungeon master. Yeah, uh, but on researching, you've you've really been uh, a shaping force behind a lot of the products that are related to Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you know, so and 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 I, so I'm curious about that. You know, I, I uh, you were you wrote your first module and sold it to. It was either was it Dungeon or Dragon magazine when you in 1988. Yeah, that would have been. Um Dungeon magazine. That okay. Was back when I was that was I was still a teenager back then, and uh, Dungeon was a new magazine on the scene. It was featuring adventures. Adventures were right up my alley, so I started throwing pitches to the editors, and eventually uh, managed to throw one that they liked. Very cool. And and from what I understand, through the magazine's run, you were the most prolific contributor, if I understand right. Yeah, I cert- I became that way. Yeah. And yeah. Then, um, after they got to know me and uh, realized that you know I'm a I'm a professional and I'm deadline motivated, 
they would throw me projects that they needed, specific assignments. And so the relationship kind of changed from an outsider looking in to being sort of an outsider who was kind of welcomed into the fold. Nice. Uh, but I mean, it's kind of, you know, you have to understand on the outside looking in, like you're talking about, that's a lot of teenagers dreams out there <laughs> is to, you yeah. know, is to like, hey, I got something published. Oh, and now it's working on Dungeons and Dragons is a yeah. dream job, and uh, I can I can certainly understand, and I, I certainly remember what it was like trying to break in through the right back door. Right. Well, in fact, I've seen. I was going to bring this up, but this kind of leads naturally into it. Now, on your on your Twitter feed, and I recommend that anybody who's the, is interested in Dungeons and Dragons at all, but especially dungeon masters, subscribe to your Twitter feed because you do a constant QA. It's just like a constant running questions and answer, uh, you know, and, and I, I mean, uh, you're very generous with your time. I mean, the amount of amount of questions that you answer and they're usually for, for a long time. For a long time, I was resistant to joining Twitter because I thought it would be this sucking vortex that would steal all my time. But actually, it's a nice counterbalance because um, I love I love the constraints of trying to get a answer out there in 140 characters or less. Right. It, it definitely it definitely uh, improves your uh, is tersicity even a word? It helps you be more terse in your in your responses and remove what's extraneous. I get. I've, I've heard a lot of writers, and you're a you know you're you're a writer with that with you know without a doubt. A lot of writers express that same thing. They love that it forces them to, you know, kind of refine and, and, and express as much as possible in that 140 characters. Yeah. Uh, it, limits the, it limits the scope of the of the questions too, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, one thing that that I've seen that is not related to the rules or the craft of dungeon mastering uh, an answer that I've seen or a question I see you get asked quite often is, you know, how do I break into D and D? How do I contribute? How do I submit? And the answer that, that I've seen give consistently is, you know, when, when we see people doing stuff we like, we reach out to them. Right. And actually that's, that's quite a departure from how it used to be in the olden days. Um, when when there were when the magazines were up and running and they were largely driven by content um, from outside freelancers, it was to some extent a lot easier to get noticed by us because we would be reading your articles. But now that we're now that we're mostly um, directing the projects ourselves, we're now looking out to people whose work we admire, uh, people who have established themselves in the industry or are just good writers um, with either geek cred or uh, they are just doing something interesting and cool that people are talking about. So now we're reaching out to them. It sort of changed the way we work, but it also means that we're getting we're we're really getting the best talent that we can find. Right. Well, that's you know, and, and you've still got, you know, some some uh, existing talent that's been around for quite a while. Uh, so it's you know, you've, uh, any healthy company wants to have a mix of both, right? So I mean, uh, and I guess what I'm saying, I know that that Ed Greenwood still writes novels does he is ed Green, greenwood involved with shaping any of the actual like adventures or, or the game itself or is he mainly just on the fiction side now uh so we work with ed kind of in in three capacities okay. one is uh we relate to him uh just on a personal level we're friends um and second we have him on board as a consultant uh, essentially he's a hired consultant for the realms uh, so when we're getting ready to tell a new story set in the realms we meet with Ed, and he contributes ideas and helps us sort of shape that story. And then thirdly, uh, Ed is a very talented novelist, and we still use him in that capacity as well. In fact, um, I'm planning to read the first draft of a novel he just turned over tomorrow. See, that's uh, this is this is your living the dream. You're living the Dungeons and Dragon, Dragons green, dream, man. You're getting to read this stuff, you know, before it's even published. So that that is so cool, um, you know. I, and and. Uh, I, I just, you know, I, I think it's great you're going to do that. And it's good that, I mean, people, and I'm not saying this to, you know, just to uh, flatter you, people genuinely like you uh, and they like what you do. So it's it's good on both sides. It's good for you because, wow, look at all this stuff you get to do. But on the other hand, you are a very good ambassador, you know, for Dungeons & Dragons, for Wizards of the Coast, and also for role-playing in general, which right now, I mean, there's no doubt that it's in a huge renaissance. I mean, we're in a, we're oh. in a, yeah, we're, we're, we're in an upswell, which, yeah. you know, just makes me happy to no end. Um, you know, I, I, where I come from, I, I love role-playing games. I love Dungeons and Dragons. It's, it's, you can't separate it from my childhood and, you know, basically yeah. the rest of my life. I grew up in, 
basically, you know, I went to junior high, high school and all that in the 80s. Things have changed so much. Because back then, I mean, I loved D&D and I wasn't going to not play D&D, but I caught a lot of heck for loving D&D, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Culturally, it was just sort of a, it was a very kind of niche off to the side thing. And people didn't were like, what are are you doing over there? Uh, But now, I mean, it's, it's like almost mainstream. I mean, you know, it, because the people, the people who played D and D back then have gone on to have very successful careers and very powerful positions and great jobs and a lot right. of influence in mainstream culture. People like Vin Diesel can carry the message that D and D isn't uh, what you think it is. It's so much more. It's so much more of a rewarding experience. That, and that message is just getting out there, and people are realizing, oh, this is actually a very intelligent, very entertaining way to spend time with friends. And right. Then, and all of the negatives are kind of being um, pushed aside. Right, which is, you know, it's, 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 it's good because I, I love watching people enjoy it today without all of the uh, stigmas that, that were attached to it. You know, it, I'm, I'm glad for them. You know, I mean, part of me is like, back in my day, we, we earned it. But I'm like, no, that's just a, that, you know, that's a, that's a very <laughs> silly way of looking at it. And I'm just glad for them that, it's, that it is what it is now. You know, and speaking of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, we're on the fifth edition now. Uh, I would argue that it's it's it either already is or it is coming again to like the prominence or whatever that it was way back in the eighties. I mean, it's it's definitely on the upswell. Uh, we were very we were very careful in how we sort of launched it. We paid. I mean, it's, it's the first edition that we really kind of embraced all of the previous editions that had come before, and it's the first edition where we reached out to the community. I mean, by the end of the playtest period, we had over 200,000 mm-hmm. playtesters, and we, were, we spent two years combing through their feedback. And so this edition is really the closest thing to what we hope are, is people's ideal of Dungeons & Dragons. Um, and I think it's I think its success shows that um, that uh, this game is just so important in people's lives that once you once you have tasted Dungeons and Dragons and fallen in love with it, you never fall out of love with it. Right. I, I certainly haven't. I mean, there there is a lens of and I'm being I mean, people are going to think I'm being overly dramatic here, but. Playing games like Dungeons and Dragons and thinking in that way and that social aspect of it, that's part of the lens of how I look at life. I mean, that, it was so formative, you know, uh, just the, the role playing game experience and Dungeons and Dragons and, and all that, that, it, you know, it really does. Once it gets, you know, it's hard. You can't really just say, uh, you know, I, I, if you really if it really bites you now, if you play one game and you're like, uh, you know, that was OK. But I mean, if you really get into it. I don't think you ever quite set it aside at any point because um, no. it's just it's, so engaging. And there's so many elements to it that sort of define you as a person going forward. Just the fact that you can project your consciousness or yourself into a character and pretend to be that person means that by the time you've done that enough, you as a person are able to get out of yourself and just sort of look at other points of view and understand other points of view because you've had that experience of stepping out of yourself. You know, that's a good point. Uh, you know, one of the things I've thought in, in the, recently in the past few years is, you know, I've come to the realization that, that like, other people are not extras in my movie. You know what I mean? They, are, they, they have their own movies going on. You know, they are fully realized people. Yeah. Uh, and, and one of the ways is doing that, you can't do that unless you have empathy and, and can imagine yourself being in their shoes. And, and games like Dungeons and Dragons definitely lend themselves to that. I want to give out real quick, uh, again, our phone number is 501-823-0965. That's 501-823-0965. And people can also tweet me at Shane Place. I think Kendall's telling me we've got somebody on the line here that says they've been on the show before. Hold on a second. Let's, let's, who, do we have them, Kendall? I am Dungeon Master, your guide in the realm of Dungeons and Dragons. No, 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 now see, Dungeon Master, this is Chris's time. See, here's what happened, Chris. We had, a, I did a segment a few weeks ago on D- Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition, and I let, uh-huh. him, I let him introduce it. Because he called me up and said, man, I haven't had work for a while. I said, okay, I'll, you know, and now he's coming around all the time. So, <laughs> so DM, we love you, but this is, this is Chris's time. So, uh but anyway, did, where, what did you think? And I, I, did you like the cartoon? Were you a fan? Um, so, yes, I was a fan. I was certainly disappointed when it ended. 
I thought there was there was more story to tell. I didn't know enough about Eric, and I didn't know enough right. about Bobby and all the other characters. Um, but I'm afraid to go back and watch it because I think um, I might realize it's not as good. It, as it holds up better than you think. I, I okay. bought the uh, about a year ago. I bought the the, the DVD set. It yeah. actually holds up better than you think. I mean, there's some of that. You know, uh, I mean, cartoons have, have matured in their storytelling, right, since the 80s for okay. the most part. But it, it holds up pretty well. I'll tell you uh, what's what's interesting. If you find it out there, there's some information out there. They had proposed what the final uh, episode would be. And it's it's really good. I, I don't want to ruin it for you, but it, it has to do with, with Dungeon Masters and Venger's relationship and, and some closure and resolution there. And it's really pretty powerful, especially for an '80s kids cartoon. So if you know if you have some free time, you might go look that up. But but it held it held up better than I thought, to be quite honest. So I, I think we're overdue for a new cartoon. But that's right. Just... Yeah, you're not saying you are neither confirming nor denying anything officially. That's just a statement, right? I'm just expressing my own personal wishes. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, I've got some questions for you as a DM. If we can move over into that that role, um, if you don't mind. Uh, oh, you know, before we do that, I did want to ask, uh, I think it was, is it Gregory Tito Taito? I think he's the Wizards communications yeah, manager. Yeah. Uh, you know, he puts in on something on Twitter and it mentioned, I think you're a story manager. Am I getting that right? That's right. I'm my title now. And I've had a number of titles in the almost 20 years I've worked at Wizards, but my current title is story design manager. And that really means that uh, I lead a very small team that's responsible for coming up with the stories that serve as the framework for all of our entertainment experiences. So, um, for instance, uh, we've got a story coming up uh, this summer uh, called Rage of Rage of Demons. Demons, right? Big stuff. Um, and so we create this story bible that sort of defines all of the elements of that story, the, the conflict, the main characters, and then we send that out to all of our partners and our internal folks and that becomes the framework for which they create other content tied to that story. So uh, uh, the company Cryptic, who works on the Neverwinter game, uses it. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the guys at Sword Coast Legends use it. Mm -hmm. WizKids uses it when making their mini sets, things like that. So my job is to come up with these stories, uh, to make them resonant with the fans, with the audience, and then to let our partners take that material and expand on it as they see fit. Which, I mean, that's, you know... Not only is that really cool, but that's really wise of Wizards of the Coast with how entertainment works today. Because I don't, you know, it's very rare to find somebody who just plays role-playing games but doesn't play video games, right? right. And more yeah. and more people who play video games are playing role-playing games. And then, of course, you got Wiz kids with their, their click stuff. So that, that's very smart. Yeah. Um, well, the, it, you know, the heart of D&D has always been the role-playing game, but there are so many expressions of D&D, and we don't necessarily know how somebody is going to come into the brand. And so having these relatable stories that are designed to sort of trumpet the most iconic, memorable elements of Dungeons & Dragons, be they dragons, be they um, demons, be they a right. uh, specific world or whatever, um, it really is an opportunity for us to get all D&D fans familiar with all of the best parts of Dungeons & Dragons. Well, right, because D&D started, and, and I will argue, now somebody else, out, you know, there's, this is subjective, uh, somebody else say, no, no, they'll have a bone to pick with me for saying this based on their experience. But I will, I would argue that you, Chris, are probably the most uh, well-known dungeon master right after Gary Gygax. Okay, that that's my personal opinion. Now, wow. uh, just you know, because your visibility is so high associated with the game. Right now, yeah. Gary Gygax, and there's other people that were involved. But you know, when people look back on history, they they land on Gygax. And, you know, I know there was Dave Arneson and some other folks, yeah. but but he, you know, his D&D that he that he came out with that just took the world by storm was basically just a dungeon crawl. Yeah. Right. And and D&D has become so much more than that. I mean, you can play D&D for 20 years and never go into a dungeon. Right. right. I mean, you, you tell stories with it. In fact, I've I've thought. At, at times, and I'm not suggesting we change the name Dungeons and Dragons. I love the name Dungeons and Dragons. It's it's iconic to me for a whole culture. Um but at times I've thought, you know, if they would have called it Forgotten Realms <laughs> and that was the name of the game, they would have probably avoided some of the stigma with it because, you know, people are like Dungeons and Dragons. What is all that about? Because it's, it's not just dungeons and it's not just dragons that you can have all these amazing settings 
you can tell all these different kinds of stories. Uh, it doesn't have to be the class. Now, most people think of D&D, although this is changing, uh, you know, as sort of a medieval setting with fantasy elements added, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Tolkien or, or Greyhawk in, in D&D. Part. But it, it doesn't have to be that. I mean, it can be like Eberron. Oh, D&D is, is very, very broad. One of the appeals, I think, is that, um, as, and we've seen through the various campaign settings that have been created, like you mentioned, Eberron, that D&D, one of the things that's great about it is its flexibility in terms of tone, in terms of atmosphere, in terms of what you can include. You can go Lovecraftian with mind flares, or you can, you can go whimsical, um, you know, with sprites and, and fey and stuff like that, to just outright wacky. Right. Like, uh, uh, a lot of the outer planes sort of embody that. That's one of the things about D&D that's great is um, tonally you can really play with it. And one of the things we're doing with our stories is making sure as we move from one story to the next that we show just how versatile and flexible D&D can be. Right. And in fact, with, with your, your first major, now we're talking about Rage of Demons is coming soon, but the yeah. first one was Princes of the Apocalypse. Actually, with, the, first one was, the first one was Tyranny of Dragons. Oh, Tyranny, my bad. Yeah, yeah, Tyranny we, of Dragons. Which we was launched t- that with 5th edition because it felt very natural to make dragons right. sort of one of the first threats that you have to and make. And, of course, you had, you had Tiamat. Not, and, yeah. we, and we moved on to Elemental Evil with the Princes of the Apocalypse. That was right. Okay, yeah, that, that's which right. Harkened, which actually hearkened back to uh, a Gary Gygax adventure. Temple of Elemental Evil. Days. Right. Absolutely. Well, that was what the point I was going to that I was kind of leading to was that the the new way of doing D and D storytelling, if you will, although I'm sure that homebrewed Dungeon Masters have done this forever, uh, is you know the the Princes of the Apocalypse is this wide ranging storyline that crosses multiple media that basically took an old module as its inspiration. Yeah. So that that kind of symbolizes the new versus the quote unquote old D and D, you know, way of of a way of launching stories, if you will. So, uh, but yeah, I had forgotten that. Yeah, sorry about it. the uh, tyranny of dragons, which was Tiamat. Which, by the way, I still say that Takesis would take Tiamat down, but I'm in the <laughs> I'm in the minority there. Takesis, Tiamat, they're one in the Yeah, same. that's pretty much what everybody says. Dragonlance, tomato, tomato. Yeah, Dragonlance is my favorite setting i mean just barna and hands down the, the, the power the the war of the land story is a very powerful story right yeah. well that was probably the only story line that i can think of from the older style D that kind of touches what you're trying to do now right this this big wide range wide scope storytelling uh but even it i mean it didn't really intentionally cross mediums although there were you know novels and uh, uh, in, its, in, its, in its day, it was fairly daring because right. it did have TRPGs and novels sort of married together. That was that was a pretty new idea back then. We've just sort of expanded because now we've got the Internet, which right. we didn't have back then and right. things like that. Well, so let me ask, and this may be one of those questions that either, A, you're like, I just don't answer that, or maybe even Wizards of Coast like, ah, don't, don't answer that. But if you can answer it, do you have a favorite setting? Um. Yes, I do, and uh, it's going to sound selfish of me to say so, but the favorite, my favorite setting is whatever my home game setting ah, is right. at the moment. Right, which you've, uh, you've had several. Uh, but if, you want, if you want to refine the question to say what's my favorite published yeah, okay. uh, D&D setting, uh, wow, that is really, really hard. Um, I, I, I would venture to say Planescape. Ah, Okay. Um, and I've, I have a history with Planescape. Uh, I did some Planescape adventures back uh, for Dungeon Magazine, and there's something about the nature of uh, the philosophy mm-hmm. behind the setting that really sort of appeals to me. It, it deepens D&D, much like you said, how, how we've evolved from not just talking about D&D as a dungeon exploration game, but uh, there's so much more to do. Planescape really opened my eyes to the flexibility mm. of the game. And it dealt with serious, mm-hmm. in, in sort of a goofy, offhanded way, it dealt with some very, fairly serious morality and uh, philosophical questions. And I thought that that was fascinating. So I've always been entranced by that setting. I love the scope of it. I love the daring of it. I love that they took chances in designing it. Mm-hmm. And I also, I also know a few secret stories about how that setting came around, which actually sort of, uh, they kind of explain what was going on at TSR at the time oh. <laughs> that it was being created. And so there's like a meta 
level uh-huh. to the setting that I can appreciate. So people were working through some personal demons. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, and we're about to take a break. When we come back, uh, I, I've got a couple of DM related questions, and then we'll. You've graciously offered to give us some more time to to you know maybe talk about some D and D related news. But I did want to mention Planescape Torment. The video game is one of the w- most well remembered of the D and D computer games, and it, it transcended clicky clicky kill stuff into a morality tale. So, uh, yeah, so um, people, you know, people still rave about that game. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Chris has graciously offered to hang with us, and we will, we will. I'm going to ask him a couple of questions DM related, and then we'll try to cover some D and D news. Kendall, let's uh, hit that break, and, and we'll be back here in a couple of minutes. Privately owned and licensed by the Arkansas State Police, Rock City Alarm Company has been in business since 1996, specializing in sales, installation, servicing, and monitoring of burglar alarms and fire alarms for the state of Arkansas. Rock City Alarm provides service for residential and commercial alarms and now provides cellular monitoring with remote arm and disarm. Just call John Hardiman at 501-541-8747. That's John Hardiman at 501-541-8747. Call Chapman Service today for all your air conditioning and electrical concerns. 0% financing till January 2020 for a limited time. Voted best of the best for five years in a row. It's hard to stop a train. Chapman Service, all you want in an air conditioning and an electrical company, nothing you don't. Shane Plays Radio is blessed to have sponsors, and we appreciate them very much. However, did you know that you can also support the show as an individual? For as little as $1 an episode, simply go to patreon.com slash Shane Plays. In business for over 15 years, the Hillcrest Doghouse provides full grooming, bathing, boarding, and daycare services for just about all breeds with knowledgeable and friendly staff, including a licensed groomer with over 10 years' experience. The Hillcrest Doghouse uses all-natural shampoos, including a pesticide-free flea shampoo. All kennels are situated where we work, which means your companion is rarely left alone, providing the benefit of full interaction with our friendly staff. Additionally, we walk your dog at least three times a day to ensure a happy day. Grooming and boarding packages are also available at great prices. The Hillcrest Doghouse is located at 3924 West Markham Street in Little Rock. Call the Hillcrest Doghouse at 501-296-9800. That's 501-296-9800. We're also on Facebook. Find us and like us. Welcome back. We've got uh, Chris Perkins. Uh, not only is he what I call and others the Dungeon Master to the Stars, but he is deeply, deeply, deeply embedded with uh, with Dungeons and Dragons as a product and as an experience. So I, I, I that's one of the reasons why I love to interview people. I learn more uh, both through talking to them and uh, researching them. But what we have now, uh, Chris, and thanks again for for holding through the break. Uh, I've got some questions, uh, I, on Reddit, I told people you were coming on and got some questions from Reddit, but I wanted to ask you a couple personally, if that's okay. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to tell you, you know, I'm going to ask you what your, if you have one, and I know it's like, you know, what is, what's like asking who your favorite child is, you know, what your favorite dungeon master moment is that just a, this is what, you know, stands out in my mind. And I'll tell you what mine is. This was like back in the early 90s. I think we were playing second edition. And I did a homebrew adventure. uh, And I had this room in the, it was like going going through like a, uh, it was basically a dungeon crawl. But I had this room and it was very dark, dank room. And in the middle there was an old fountain that was no longer used. And there was a water elemental in it. And, you know, I... The way I described the room uh, and what was happening when, you know, as the water elemental started stirring and the shadows and the sounds and all these things, the party ran. They they said, we don't want to go in there. <laughs> and that was my favorite moment, and I'll tell you why. You freaked him out. Yeah, it transcended that this is a, a, a walking stat block that we can kill and get XP, and they were more worried about the atmosphere and preserving their characters' lives. 
And I totally didn't see that coming. So that's probably my favorite moment. Now, I, I've been taking people through the starter adventure, uh, you know, the Lost Mine of Fandelver for, um, uh, what do you got, uh, or what do you call it, uh, fifth edition, my bad, yep. starter set. And I don't want to give anything away, but there's, there's, there's the Red Brands hideout. And in one part, there's, there's a part where there's like a chasm, and it's dark, and there's a, a creature with a big eyeball. It's not a beholder. And they didn't want to go in there either. And I was like, yeah, see, that's, that's when it really stops becoming just dice rolling, right? Yeah. So, so that was a favor for me. So do you have something that stands out to you like that? There are so many, um, but one that leaps to mind is occurred during one of the um, Acquisitions Incorporated live games. Right. And it, it typifies, uh, it's an example of what can happen in a game, and I've seen it happen in other places too, and every time it happens, I'm just thrilled. So as many people know, I, uh, events, not I, but events conspired to kill Will Wheaton's character. Oh. <laughs> um, so his character, Aofel, fell into an acid pit, and he couldn't get out, and he dissolved and died. And uh, Will basically, rather than blame me for it, he blamed one of the other characters, Scott Kurtz's character, Benwin Bronzebottom. Oh, yeah. Who I, I like. I'll tell you, my favorite character is Dark Magic, but I like Benwin as well. But anyway. <laughs> Jim, Dark I, Magic is hu- Jim Dark Magic is hugely popula- popular. He'd have his own television show. Yeah, I love Dark Magic. Yeah. Um, so anyway, at the next session that we did, which sort of picked up that story, and the party, the survivors had to go into hell to get Aofel out. Um, there was a happy reunion, basically. And uh, there was this great moment of reconciliation between Will's character, Aofel, and Scott's character, Binwin, and actually sort of a reconciliation of the players as well. And I didn't have to do anything. Basically, I had, I had sort of set up events that allowed this reconciliation to happen, but it happened entirely on its own. I had no idea it was going to happen. It was completely improvi- improvised by Will and Scott, and I just had to sit there and enjoy it. That's the best. I mean, it was, that, like, it was yeah, like me yeah. watching a scene from a movie that I really, really like. Yeah, that, that's, see, that's what people... The people that have never played a role-playing game or D&D, that's what they don't understand. It's not just about a bunch of paper with stuff written on it and dice and, you know, calculator. That, they, that is to get us to that, right? So, I'm, like when I'm, a, I'm a DM who likes it when the players kind of take command of the, of the story, right. take command of the world. I'm happy when I'm just sitting there and mm-hmm. watching. I don't have to be the guy pulling the strings or forcing things to happen or... or describing rooms and stuff i'm happy to sit there for 10 minutes while players just argue among themselves about what to do next right yeah because then that means they're engaged hey we've actually chris we have a caller online we have a we have david from california david uh welcome to the show oh thank you hey so what is uh and i'm gonna throw out i i know who this is this is david Beatty, who is behind a cool new or not an old it's a relaunch of a game called mega wars so go out to megawars.net folks but anyway david what is your question and or comment for chris perkins well i i I think that a lot of people are missing out in in um dungeons and dragons because they don't play it on paper they play it basically in computer games like uh baldur's gate coming out that's dungeons and dragons People don't realize that, and they need to realize that there is so much more to playing as a group in person together at, on a tabletop. I, I totally 100% agree with that. You can have a lot of fun playing the computer version, but you can only do what the developers anticipated that you're going to do. It, it really limits some of the sandbox of it. I'm going I'm to kick that over to Chris and see if he has any comments on it. Well, it's sort Thanks, of like Shane. The, Thank you, David. Sort of like the, it's sort of like the Marvel model where... Uh, most of a lot of the audience is going to access Marvel through the movies, but then you need some mechanism by which you can say, "Hey, if you want to get into Marvel, if you really want to get into the heart of these characters, then you've got to go pick up the comics." That's a good way to put it. I never thought and of it that so, way. And so it's very similar to D and D. We just need to have mechanisms that'll say, "Hey, you enjoyed Baldur's Gate," or "Hey, you enjoyed Sword Coast Legends." And guess what? There's this thing out there called the TRPG, tabletop role-playing game, which you actually play around a table with friends. It's the heart of D&D, and it has a whole new level of depth for you. And I think that's, that's really sort of the, the piece of the puzzle that we need to nail. Right. Making sure, making sure that every one of these 
um, satellite experiences for Dungeons & Dragons eventually leads you to or lets you discover where it all came from. All right. Well, that I mean, that's that's a that's a great, uh, great point. All right. So uh, right before David called, uh, I was my other question for you. Now that we talked about those moments that transcend the game and you remind you why it's so great. Chris, this is very important. I mean, the world I think I think that uh, that the world leaders of all countries are listening right now for the answer to this. This is big. All right. Have you ever had the urge to randomly exclaim Go for the eyes, boo, at what would be an extremely awkward moment. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't? <laughs> well, exactly, hasn't? right? Um, y- yeah. Uh, <laughs> for those who don't know, that quote originated from the Baldur's Gate computer games. Right. Uh, the, the speaker of that quote is a dull fellow named Minsk. Yeah, and he has his miniature giant space hamster. Space hamster, exactly, which is basically just a normal yeah. hamster. He goes, go um, for the eyes, boo. Go for the eyes, boo. Yeah, yeah, which uh, yeah, which actually, I guess he made it into the comic books. There's a new Dungeons & Dragons did. comic book that men can boo. Of, it's one of the weird instances where a character that was not created in the TRPG has kind of exploded on his own and, and crossed media platforms. He's um, the Harley Quinn of D&D. He is. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't say that to his face, though. So, no. Yeah. Not, not, not that he would understand what you're saying anyway. Yeah, he might think I was complimenting him. All right. So I've got some questions from Redditors. Um, and, okay, so here is uh, some questions from Redditors. This is from No No Not A One, Reddit user No No Not A One. He said, when you were a new DM, within the first couple of years, what was a piece of advice that seemed stupid at the time but you later embraced? Oh boy, when I was a new DM, that goes way back. Way back. Um, so uh, I didn't have a lot of other DMs. There wasn't, there wasn't forums or anything else that I could turn to as a DM, so I, and I didn't have any other friends who liked to DM, so I was kind of floating out on my own. Uh, most of my advice really came from reading the DMG, grokking what Gary was trying to Grokking. I love grok. Yes. Um, but there was... A point. I'm trying to think. Um, you know, there. I, I was I was pretty much just floundering the first few years I play. I I ran the game. I honestly half the time I didn't know what I was doing. Right. I I think that um, one thing that I recall is I was at Gen Con. I was in a game that Gary was running with like seven other players and I realized that he was not actually paying attention to what was on the page Um, Mm. that he was just kind of making stuff up he was he was in his head trying to come up Mm -hmm. with an interesting story to tell and I realized that the adventure was just kind of like a security blanket Mm -hmm. but if you could get if you could drop the security blanket if you felt comfortable doing that you could just sort of go off on your own and do your own thing and that's when I realized that I, I, as a DM, should not be a slave to the text. I should not be a slave to the written adventure. I should just do what feels natural, what feels fun, and what, right. seems, what the players seem to be responding to, and that was a revelation for me. Well, you know, every, every tabletop game on a certain level is a social compact, yeah. and, and the compact is we're here to have fun. Now, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to take, if there's a character who's invested a lot of time in learning the rules and this and that, I don't want to completely disregard that, Uh because then they'll feel like, well, hey, I put all this time into it, and then you're, you know, you're completely disregarding everything that I think the game is. Uh, but you can also, you know, the, the ultimate goal is to have fun, right? Yeah. And, and, I mean, that's why you're together, is to tell a good story and to have fun. So, the, you know, and, and I do that. When I DM, my players have the most fun when I do ad lib it a bit and, you know, say, hey, you know what? That sounded good when I first thought about it, but I'm not going to do that now. Or I'm going to do something funny, spontaneous. It's funny you should mention the social compact because when DMs run into trouble, it's almost always because somebody in the group is not respecting that social contract. Right. That, and that, that there's, a, there's a player who's being intentionally belligerent or disruptive or mm-hmm. trying to reduce the fun, or it's a DM who unconsciously is not paying attention to what the player's needs are and is not actually giving them the experience that they want. And I think DMs have to be mindful of that social compact. They have to honor it. And so, too, do the players. 
Right. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's people are together to have a good time. All right. Absolutely. So, and it doesn't matter how good of a DM you are. If you've got a bad player or a set of bad players, yep. you're not going to be able to successfully. Absolutely. One person can ruin it for everybody. So, yeah. uh, okay. So here's, here's another question. This is also from no, no, not a one. This one, you know, I mean, feel free to, to not even answer it if you don't want, but I'm going to throw it out there because they took the time to write it. They said, I live in a poverty stricken area. And we get no gaming cons at all for a few hundred miles. If I wanted Chris to sign my fifth edition Dungeon Master's Guide, because I send it uh, to like World of the Co- Wizards of the Coast headquarters with prepaid shipping to sign it. Now I'm sure there's probably policies already in place. But did you do you get a request like this often? Uh, yeah, we get requests like that a lot, and uh, that's perfectly cool. Um, okay. If, if you've if you've basically taken the trouble to send it to us, and there's like a return. Uh, postage there absolutely will sign it okay well i will i will make yeah. sure to and follow if, if up with them. and if there's a little note inside that includes you know specific individuals other right. individuals who'd like to sign it we don't mind running around the building with a book and having a bunch of people sign it all right well you know that is super cool and it's things like that that are you know keep the community going strong so i will i will definitely make sure to let no no not yeah. a one know that that is legit or uh, would is cool to do okay so i have one from the patched fool um and he says, uh, I'm a big Acquisitions Incorporated fan, mostly because of the amazing DMing. My question for Chris is the same question I've Googled a thousand times. Where can I buy a black D&D beanie like Chris's? <laughs> he says, I'd rather buy one than have it custom made, but he'll have it custom made if he has to. Right. Um, I've joked about this on Twitter a lot yeah. about how I got my black beanie, and I try to make up stories every time somebody asks because I get asked a lot. In honest truth, the black beanie just showed up on my chair one day, and oh, nice. uh, it was a—it was just the sort of promotional thing. Um, was that, it a beanie fairy? Our, was the beanie fairy running around? The beanie around? fairy, yeah. yes. The, the beanie <laughs> fairy dropped off the beanie. I don't know where it came from, but I have seen other people in the company wearing them. And when I've talked to the brand team, uh, it was just sort of specially made as a promotional item. I don't think it's readily available, uh, but but. Um, I have had conversations with people in the building about um, how we how we get these things out there in the world. So I think I think we might see in the future uh, places or opportunities where these things will be readily available. I just don't know where. It's kind of outside my bailiwick. It's not I something you. I deal with. Um, but I, I hope I hope that other people get to wear it because it really is a cool beanie. It is cool. Um, I mean, it's your pro, it's your Twitter profile yeah. pic right now, if I if I remember right. That's right. Yeah, yes. yeah. And we've done other promotional items that have taken off. For instance, uh, we did a partnership with Loot Crate where we had a D and D T shirt in one of their crates, and uh, it was this beautiful red with a black giant ampersand, sort of a distressed ah. ampersand on it. It was very popular, uh, and uh, I I didn't get one initially, but I was able to track one down because I know people. But it's very hard to get, and it's very exclusive. Uh, that kind of thing, I don't mind being chase stuff. But there's other stuff that I wish was just out there in the yeah. world, and I hope that one day people will be able to get the thing. Get a so beanie, yeah. Because one be- that beanie fairy drops off for me for yeah, free. The beanie fairy just shows up. All right. So last question off uh, t- Reddit that we have time for. This is from Doc Lestrange. He says, "We know that it's impossible to plan for your players are going to do, but what are some of the best ways to keep players focused that you've found?" And we've only got about a minute, Chris. Sorry, we're about. Oh, to I'll keep it yet. very brief. Yeah. Um, so the thing that the one trick that I do is when players lack focus, I just immediately cut to the trace. I just address a player directly and say, "Okay, what does your character do?" Ah, yeah. Um, and it all it just puts them instantly in the moment of having to make a decision, and that usually just snaps them out of it. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, you people are people, and they're gonna lose focus for moments, or there's gonna be occasional side conversations. I, I personally try to leave a little bit of room for it, but then I'll say, like you're, you know, I'll say, hey, Gibbs, what do you want to do? You know, uh, let me, you know, kind of remind you of 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 kind of where you're at or, or whatever, just to kind of get them thinking yeah. about it again. But at the same time, you don't want to. You don't want to so control them that they feel like that they're suffocated and can't even move right. at all, you know. So, yeah. yeah. The other fall, the other the fallback plan is to make farting noises with my arm. Well, you know, that that is uh that's always that you know, I, I found that that works in in a multitude of situations. Uh but but definitely yeah. in dungeons and dragons. See, that's why people these are tips from the pros. I mean, you, <laughs> you can't go wrong. Well, I'm about to have to take another break, Chris. We didn't get into the D&D news, but this this speaks to what you and I were talking about a while ago. You know, that's a fallback. I'd rather have a spontaneous conversation with you than forced to get into news. I can I can give news anytime. So I appreciate you taking the time 
to hang with us. I'm going to take a break. If you just feel frisky, you're welcome to hang. Uh, if you need to go, thank you so much for the for your time. I compliment you on the stories that are happening in Dungeons & Dragons right now. And I compliment you. you and the entire team on 5th edition. I think time will say... Um, the only reason I'm not saying that it's one of my favorite editions right now is because you have to give it time to look back on. But... I, it's right up there with first edition for me. It's great. I love that you managed to somehow streamline the rules, but yet still make it not feel too easy or too simplified. And you got the role playing back into it with uh, with the flaws and the you know the uh, 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 backgrounds. And I love inspiration. I love inspiration. Oh. Yeah, such a great rule. So, well, it definitely is my favorite edition, and uh, I, I should I should run because I do have the, I do have a totally understand. I appreciate, but I just want to say that yeah. I hope people do enjoy the Rage of Demons story. We yep. put a lot of work into it, and a lot of our partners have done awesome things with it. And I look forward to hearing what people think. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it as well. Thanks again, Chris Perkins, story manager for D and D, New York Times bestselling author, and the DM to the stars. Thank you so much, Chris. My pleasure. Right. Yeah, and we're going to hit a break and when we get back we'll wrap with a little bit of news comic book lovers Michael Tierney's local comic book stores meet all of your comic book needs with friendly service visit the comic book store on Treasure Hill Road in Little Rock or collector's edition on JFK Boulevard in North Little Rock and don't forget to click on over to the wildstars.com website I personally have been a customer of Michael's since the mid-80s, and I trust him for my reserve list still today. Michael knows comics. In addition to being in business for 34 years, he has written multiple columns for comic magazines, is an Overstreet Price Guide advisor, and publishes his own comic book series, The Wild Stars. Trust me, these stores are run by a comic book lover for comic book lovers. Remember, for all of your comic book needs with friendly service and to get your copies of The Wild Stars, make sure to visit the comic book store on Treasure Hill Road in Little Rock or Collector's Edition on JFK Boulevard in North Little Rock and visit thewildstars.com to learn more. Did you know that your business can provide its employees with the same benefits packages as even the largest Fortune 500 companies, often at no direct cost to you, the business owner, and while saving money at the same time? If you've always thought that you would like to offer those big company benefits to your employees but thought that there was no way, let our team at the Makeham Teague Agency come by and show you how it can be possible and how simple it is to put into place. We offer major medical and group and individual plans, on or off exchange, dental and vision, life products, cancer, accident, and more. These benefits create that ever so priceless commodity known as loyalty. And yes, we are ACA certified. We even offer these same benefits on the individual basis if you're just a one-person entrepreneur or making things happen on your own. Give us a call today at 501-838-6827 to schedule your no-obligation on-site consultation. The Makeham Teague Agency is serving all of Arkansas and surrounding states. 501 501- 838-6827. Give us 1% of your trust and we'll earn the other 99. All right, we're back from that break. I've got a uh, I also have a new sponsor. Folks, when you hear my sponsors, if you call them or contact them, make sure to tell them Shame Place sent you because they are, you know, they're they're keeping the show on the air. They're putting the show on the air. So if this this is valuable to you, if you like the show and you contact one of the sponsors, please make sure to tell them that Shane Place sent you. And don't forget, if you want, you can always support the show uh, with as little as a dollar an episode. You don't have to do it, but if you want to, if you like the show, you can go to Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Shane Place. And you can support the show with as little as a dollar a show. I'm trying to have a have a balance between uh listeners supporting the show and sponsors but you know it's just kind of an experiment we'll see how i go but i appreciate any support or sponsors we get we got a new sponsor jlm tree servicing jared luke mccoy uh he's done work for me does a great job it's jlm tree servicing can take care of your tree servicing needs they can be reached at 501 501- Three five one seven seven one four online at jlmservicing.com and on Facebook. Do you have limbs touching the roof or killing your grass with too much shade? Do you have leaves connecting in the pool or collecting in the pool or gutters? Do you need to remove that unsightly dead tree? JLM, JLM Services is insured. It provides free estimates, serves all of Central Arkansas, and doesn't collect payment until the job is well done. JLM Tree Servicing, 501 501- 
351-7714. Find them online at jlmservicing.com or on Facebook. Tell them Shame Plays sent you. So we just got a couple of minutes left on the show. I want to tell people next week, um, we've got uh, Gregory Wilson, who uh, also known as Arvin Elleron. He's a professor, he's a fantasy author, and he's a Twitch personality. So he's going to be with us the whole show, guest hosting, but also he'll be my my interview guest. So um, so that's next week. Now, I'll, I'll run through. I had, I had a few news items. I'll get through as much of them as I can before we go. But, uh, you know, thanks so much for listening. Uh, hold on a second. One, one, one second. How much time we got left, Kendall? We got 30 seconds before that, before the music starts. So, um, so anyway, uh, basically don't forget to go vote in the innies and these links are on my show notes. Okay. This is kind of D and D related news. We probably won't get through much of it before we have to go. Uh, but the innies, which is sort of the Oscars of role-playing games is going on right now. Uh, and you can, you can go, you can go vote and, and Dungeons and Dragons, some of their fifth edition products are in there. There's a really cool video. I've been wanting to mention this for a while. It's called How to Check the Balance of Your D20, Your 20 Cider. Uh, so go to my, go search for it on YouTube. Search for How to Check the Balance of Your D20 or go to shameplays.com and look at the show notes. And this guy basically has a glass of water with salt in it. And he, uh, he, he puts a D20 in there. And you can tell if, you're, if your dice is balanced well or not. It's really, it's really interesting. So there's a link on there also. Uh, from a, an article about Vin Diesel where he says how Dungeons and Dragons influenced Fast and the Furious. Is that interesting to you, Kendall? Very. Yeah, okay, so Vin Diesel is a big D&D player and he talks about how his experience with Dungeons and Dragons led him to be able to plot for the Fast and Furious games. So that's that's cool stuff. We'll leave it there. Next week we'll have uh, Gregory Wilson and also a lot of San Diego Comic-Con news. Thanks so much for listening to Shane Plays Radio.